right, guys, so we started in this idea of talking about what light is. And we've talked about light for a little bit and talked about how light's a wave. I want to continue on with this. Didn't want to load you down with a really huge, long video there. So I kind of split this one up in two. Don't know how long this one's going to be, but we're going to see. So in this, we left off and we started talking about electromagnetic radiation. And whenever we looked at that, at electromagnetic radiation, we were looking at uh, we even looked at that electromagnetic uh, spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, and I sent you guys that as well with the video link in your mind. And along with that, also uh, knowing that all electromagnetic radiation is on that electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, we're going to talk more about what exactly is electromagnetic radiation, but we got to cover a couple of things before we get there. So the first thing I want to talk about is this last formula that I told you we were going to discuss, okay? In this last formula, it's super, super important, all right? I want to make sure that you guys get uh, the importance of this formula as well as the first one. So the first light equation, and that's what we're going to refer to these two as. So the first light equation we covered was the speed of light equals wavelength times frequency, okay? And we went over that in some detail, what those were, and we broke down what that constant was, this C, and how that was 2.98 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And those matter will be uh, later on, hopefully, you know, I'll see you in class on Tuesday, actually in person. If not, we'll be Zooming, and we'll actually work through. That's what we'll do is we'll actually start using those equations and do the mathematical part of this unit. So we're looking at. But the second one that we need to talk about is the one I left you off with. And that is E equals the lowercase h and <coughs> nu. So whenever you're breaking this down and you're looking at this, okay, here's the important parts to know. This is the thing, is like off that electromagnetic spectrum. One thing you've seen was with the electromagnetic spectrum as we went from right to left. So as we went from radio waves to gamma rays, what we've seen, there was this increase in, um, increase in energy. Okay, So energy would increase. And in this, this is one very important aspect that we look at, is wanting to know energy. Now there's somebody that did this, and we'll discuss them here in a little bit, which brings me in the first breaking down what E is for. E is energy. Now for us, everything we're going to use with this in energy, everything's going to be measured in something you've never seen before, but it's abbreviated with a capital J. And all that stands for is joules. Okay, this is a measurement of energy. That's all it is. That's the unit for it is joules. Now going to the right side of this equation. Okay, when we get over here, we get to this letter H. And this is the important one. I told you there was a second constant we were going to talk about. This right here is our second constant. This constant has a special name. And this is named after the person that actually came up with this equation and had found this relationship and it's named after Max Planck, and it's called Planck's constant. Now Planck's constant is a constant, so it's a number, it's a value. And this is how I like to remember it. You all can laugh and make fun of me later. You all can make fun of me right now, I really don't care. But this is how I remember it. Six point stitch. That's right. I'm going Disney on all of y'all. Experiment 626 is stitched, so it's 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34. And the units for this that we're going to use is going to be joules seconds. Okay? This is the key. This is not JF. This is JS. It's not J over S. It's joule seconds, not joules per second. So make sure you remember there's a multiplication right there between these. Alright? Very 
important number to memorize right there. Have to get that down. Now in this, you're probably wondering what this is all about. Look at you and explain to you what Planck's constant is. That's the value of what we found as a multiple, what Planck found as a multiple with this, uh, dealing with electromagnetic waves and electromagnetic radiation. He really focused on black body radiation. And that's pretty much like, that's an example of, have you ever seen somebody heat up a piece of metal and get it really, really hot and it gets cherry red? What happens in this case is that energy was being absorbed in there. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. I get really excited when we get to talk about that. But that energy is being absorbed into that metal. Then it gets to a point, it starts releasing it back off. And what it'll do is it releases off light and it releases it off in a form that has enough energy that corresponds to a certain frequency. Remember, this right here is frequency. That's where this Kirillda comes into play. It corresponds to a certain frequency of waves, because remember, what is light? It's electromagnetic radiation, but electromagnetic radiation is waves. So whenever you look at this, okay, here's the key with these two. It's linked. All of this is linked together, and this is how the two equations link together. It links right here. These are the same. So that literally links those two together, and that's how we're going to use these mathematically whenever we start looking at it and we start breaking it down. But this takes us into a very interesting uh, dilemma here. So you know how we talked about light? We talked about what is light. I told you back before the 1900s, we could separate everything into two categories. You looked and you said it's either a particle or it's a wave. And we said, well, light's clearly a wave. And I showed it to you that light is a wave because of this. And we talked that light is a wave. But also with it, light just isn't a wave. Whenever you look at it, light also is a particle. And this is what really breaks us into really jumbling up and under, trying to understand the crazy world that we live in, okay? Because light is a particle. Well, then you look and you say, well, Mr. Hall can't be both. But it can. And it is. And it's proven. And this is where scientists was pre 1900s, is because light had properties that was what? But then light also did things that only particles did. Like how a wave can't be interacting with a particle. It doesn't work like that. It can't happen. So in this, we're going to talk about light, the particle. And I'm going to go back to Max Planck, for example. When he dealt with, Max Planck was dealing with that electromagnetic radiation and that black body radiation. So whenever he was heating something up and you've seen the metal turn cherry red. Why was that happening? This is what was happening. Planck was putting so much energy into that system that the system couldn't hold the energy anymore, so the energy had to be released in some way. So how the, how the metal does that is it does it through releasing something called a photon. And these photons, they get released off. And what happens is that photon, that's the particle of light that comes in. Um, and it gets released off. That's what makes like so special. These things interact together. If you don't believe me, look up a video of somebody putting a piece of metal within a mi microwave. 
That is where we see, that's a great example of seeing the interaction between waves and particles. Because what does a microwave release? It releases off electromagnetic radiation in the form of microwaves. So what happens is those microwaves come in there and hits that metal. Well, there's something special about metals. Metals, they have metallic bonds in them, which has the sea of electrons in them. We'll discuss that later on in this class. Don't freak out about it right now. Pretty much it's just a big fancy way of me telling you that those electrons, you remember those negatively charged subatomic particles that are on the outside and those energy levels that we talked about? They are just free flowing in metals. That's what gives it all its special properties. Since it's doing that, then what happens with it is that microwave comes in and excites and brings energy in and it'll kick off electrons that are just freely sitting there anyway. And that's where we'll see the sparks is that electron just flying off and hitting things and you'll see the sparks and everything fly. I'm telling you to look up a video because that will destroy your microwave if you do it. So don't do it. Just look up a video of somebody else that did it. Okay? It works a lot better for you that way. You won't get as much trouble. Your parent won't kill you. So what is the particle of uh, electromagnetic radiation we're talking about the photon. Now the photon is something special. Here's where the photon gets really, it goes really outside of your thinking. And this is like, this is why this is really my favorite unit, one of my favorite units to get to teach because it really takes us deep in thought. Whenever you look at it, what is a photon really messes with you. Because all a photon is, is just a quanta of energy with no mass. Alright? So it's a quantum of energy with no mass. Hold on me. Take somebody. So in a sense, a quantum of energy with no mass. So this is what takes place. Okay, we're going to go back to um, we're going back to a model that you guys have probably seen before, Bohr's model. And I want to focus in on this for a little bit. Okay, talking about with these photons. So this is the thing. What is an electron? I'm asking the question. I'm giving you some time just so you all know. Yes, this is very awkward for me. Just looking at a camera and trying to teach. I miss the interaction. I'm missing you all dearly. I could probably cry right now. I'm missing y'all so much. This is like really, really hard on me. Uh, especially this year. I always love to get to talk about this and have students in the room. And it's like killer right now not having you. So in this, I'm going to go in the Bohr's model. So you guys have probably seen something like this before. So these circles around here, all these are energy levels, and I'm going to symbolize those with the lowercase letter N. You'll learn about that later on. It's a special number. And in this, you, you've learned about electrons, okay? I know you've learned about electrons because we've discussed them in our class. Remember, that quiz is coming up. You better know what an electron is. And so let's say that we have this blue electron here, for example. So this is the question. What are electrons? That's the question. What are electrons? And in that, when I'm asking you this, I'm wanting to know, is it a particle or is it a wave? And if you think it's a trick question, I'm really not giving you a trick question right now. This is not a trick question. Okay, you learned that an electron is a negatively charged subatomic particle. Therefore, the electron is a particle But also within this, you learn what is electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation.
What is it? You've learned that it is a wave. Okay? You, I've told you it's a particle also, but we're talking more about how it's being a particle and drawing a relationship here. Electromagnetic radiation is a wave. So this is the interesting thing. This is where it gets interesting, okay? Like in a microwave, if you put a certain, there are certain types of metals that you put in there and you start it up, what happens are these electrons that are just freely flowing there. An electron's a particle. A microwave is a wave. So, how am I getting sparks when electromagnetic radiation is coming in and that electron is just flowing off and creating that spark? You see this interaction that's taking place. We see this happening in an interaction between a particle and a wave. So now you're looking and saying, hold up. Particles and waves, they don't interact. They can't affect each other. Yeah, we use light in our life, but right now, is the light in the room affecting me? No, the light coming from the, the, the uh, piece of technology that you're watching this video off of, is it affecting you? No, it gives you the ability for you to see things, but how like, these things don't interact. They, well, how is this taking place? This is how all of this is happening. And this is where all of this comes into place. It shows that Electromagnetic radiation is not only a wave, but electromagnetic radiation must also be a particle. Because now, whenever you look at it and you say it's kind of like two marbles hitting each other, you say that works. A particle can hit another particle. If I take this marker and I hit that other marker, it moves it. But light is hitting it, which light is a wave, it's hitting it, it's not moving, it's not going anywhere. But the particle it hits, it makes it move. That makes sense, and it works. But now you still have to be able to explain it. Just looking and saying that, okay, electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic radiation, you can't say it fast. Oh my gosh. Electromagnetic radiation as a particle just doesn't work. You just can't look and just say that. There has to be some reasoning that explanation behind it. So when you're looking at this, you have to have an explanation behind it. Luckily for us, somebody in 1905 came up with an explanation for it. And this person received a Nobel Prize for this. Now this is the thing that is very interesting. I'm probably going to catch a lot of you off guard with it. Everybody knows that Albert Einstein is probably one of the most, and arguably, the but one of the most intelligent scientists that ever lived. And he totally shaped and changed the foundation of physics as it is. And besides his general and uh, his general theory of relativity, all that he came up with. In 1905, he came up with three things. General relativity and all that was there, but the big one that we're going to talk about is explaining this phenomenon. He explained this, and this is actually where he got his Nobel Prize from. He didn't receive his Nobel Prize for his general theory of relativity, which all of us think to. He didn't get it for E equals MC squared. What he got it for was this explanation of this phenomenon, which we call the photoelectric effect. So as I said, the photoelectric effect, and we're going to give credit to the mad scientist himself, by Albert Einstein, the man, the myth, the legend, woohoo. And this came up with this photoelectric effect. And what this does, the photoelectric effect, it explains Let's say not explain it, it proves that 
light is a particle of which we call photon. All right. So this is how it does this. And this is what Albert Einstein did to prove this. Is here's the interesting thing. You can take a piece of gold foil. AU, that's the symbol for gold. Uh, you don't know that yet, but you will. It's coming very soon. You will get to know some lovely elements. And what you can do is you can have a source of light shining on it. So, your light source. Well, let's not do a light source. We're going to do electromagnetic radiation source because that's what's going to work for us. Electromagnetic radiation. I'm going to say EMR right now just because I made my electromagnetic radiation source very small. And so this is what happens. So, for example, let's say you have this piece of gold. It's just sitting there. Now gold, it is a metal, so it has metallic bonds within it. So what you'll see within it is there's a sea of electrons. And all it's saying is there's a bunch of electrons just sitting in here. So what we could do, for example, is I'll throw some of these specks in here to show you that these are just the electrons. Okay? And we'll throw over here the electron equals spec. If that makes you feel better. So within this, this is what takes place. You can take certain types of electromagnetic radiation and shine on it. And this is where things will get interesting. So let's say, for example, uh, we take red. Just red light. Just that carries off a certain uh, wavelength. I want to say it's 725, 750 nanometers, somewhere in there. Uh, but whenever you do that, comes in here. Now this is the thing that's taking place. It's coming in, but it doesn't carry enough energy for it to push any of these electrons out. So it just chills there. But, let's say you step your game up. Let's say you decide stick it in a tanning bed and you're going to stick it under some ultraviolet rays. Okay, so my electromagnetic radiation source, now we change it to some UV ray. And it comes in here and this is what will happen. It comes in with so much energy it can kick out an electron. So what we'll see, that comes in and these electrons will actually fire off. And it will kick out. This is what's happening within the photoelectric effect that's being explained. The important aspects of this is that Albert Einstein discovered was first, first important aspect was the type of electromagnetic radiation matters. The type of electromagnetic radiation that you use is important. It's what matters. Okay, that's that is so important. In this example that we use, if I'm using red, I'm using visible light, nothing takes place, but as soon as I do ultraviolet rays, it'll take place. Now this is the thing of this, and this is just a little side note. Uh, no, we're gonna switch to do number two. We'll make the point number two. Love how I'm doing this on the fly. So point number two. Amount of energy from it matters. Let's do amount of energy, not intensity.
All right, so the amount of energy, not the intensity, is what really is mattering here. So what this is saying is this red light, I could like jam this thing, make it super bright, super, super intense, and shine on this aluminum foil, uh, this gold foil, sorry, gold foil. Aluminum foil is the next foil we'll talk about. But this piece of gold foil here, and whenever we do that, we shine that piece of gold foil with that, nothing happens. Why? Because think about this. When I showed you those equations, you have a certain wavelength of light. That certain wavelength of light corresponds to a certain frequency for that light. That certain frequency corresponds to a certain amount of energy. And this will make more sense when we work through some mathematical problems. Hopefully we can do those in person though. Whenever that happens, it doesn't matter how intense. More light doesn't change the amount of energy going in there. This, it won't change the amount of energy that's coming in. But every one of these photons that's firing in here will not knock one of those off. But as soon as we have something with enough energy, it will do the job. So let's say UV ray is the first electromagnetic radiation that kicked it off. From there, you move up into higher energy levels, it'll still do it. But the amount of energy is what's mattering, not the intensity. And this is where this whole thing really comes into play with this, is this showed light's not only a wave. Now they proved light being a wave by that expansion, and we'll go more and more details later on, give you some more experiments to show you that light's a wave. But in this, this showed that, way, that light that we considered and thought was a wave interacted with something that we know was a particle, thus showing that, this, that light not only is a wave, but showed that light is both wave and particle. And this is where this thing came really big because Albert Einstein, once he did this and proved and showed this with the photoelectric effect, and this is why he gets the Nobel Prize, is because what comes from it is he creates and shows what we call today wave particle Duality. All wave particle duality is is stating that something is both a wave and a particle. It's not just one or the other. And this is where everything changed up. This is where one, one major step in the show, and okay, Albert Einstein was the person that comes in and in the right coming in the 1900s, we're thinking that we have physics all figured out. We're good. It's like physics is this nice, uh, this nice concrete wall, and there's just a couple of cracks in it. We got to feel we know everything there is to know about physics. And then Albert Einstein comes in here with this, and his general theory of relativity, and E equals mc squared, and he just he, he kind of just like came in. And just imagine like that Albert Einstein is this huge wrecking ball, and he just slams into that concrete wall and just wrecks it to pieces, and shows we don't know nothing about physics. There's plenty more for us to discover, plenty more for us to understand, which is going to bring, really is what's bringing us into this unit. Because within this, remember what this photon was. This photon was a quanta of energy. A word probably sounds vaguely familiar to you because you've probably heard something called quantum mechanics. This is what started us in to the study of quantum. And to explain to you what quantum Anything that says quantum, you're dealing with the subatomic level. That's what you're dealing with. That's why photons, you don't see photons, but they exist. That's the particle of light. But in it, it's in the quantum realm. And whenever you go into the quantum realm, you get a bunch of different rules, which brings us into something that now, now, I get to talk to you about. And is one of my favorite, favorite things to talk about. Since we have this understanding of wave-particle duality, we understand that 
we have photons and waves of light, we get to break into something really cool. Get all this erased here. I'm going to talk to you about something that's very important within the realm of chemistry and in the realm of physics and for every person that enjoys the 4th of July. I'm going to talk to you about ground states. and excited states. Now I know you probably are not familiar with what this is, so before we get going too far into this, let's just give some overview definition. Okay, so what is a ground state? Ground state is the state at which everything is at what I'm going to call a normal level. This is when everything is where it's supposed to be. Think of me, for example, right now. I'm standing on the floor. I'm on the ground. I'm supposed to be on the ground. Now, if I was hovering uh, with a jetpack, I am no longer at the ground state. I am in a, not where I'm supposed to be, okay? I do not have wings. I am not meant to fly, even though we've created pieces of machines to where we can. I'm not looking at you and telling you you shouldn't fly. I'm not against flying. I'm just using it as an example. Uh, we are supposed to have our feet on the ground. We're supposed to be on something. We're not supposed to just freely flow through air. So within this, we're at a ground state. Excited states. Now this one is an excited state. Let's just do that. This is the state at which things are at different energy levels. Because everything we're going to talk about here is going to be in terms of these energy levels. So whenever you're looking at excited states, at state at which things are at different energy levels than normal, we well, got to add that in there, sorry, than normal. Over here at the ground state, the state at which everything is at normal level or normal energy level. We'll see it that way. Normal energy level. That's how we need to refer to this. So this is what I'm talking about. So going back to like drawing up this Bohr's model. What you'll see within this These electrons are supposed to be at a certain level, okay? Inside of these, you guys should have learned this before. Pretty sure you should have learned this in middle school. These electrons should be sitting at a certain level. So, like, for example, in this first energy level, I have an electron. So, there sets that electron. Then what will happen, this is normal. That electron's supposed to be there. What will take place is you have a photon of light that comes in. So, photon. And this thing comes in here. Now remember what that photon is. Photon is just a quantum of energy. It's all it is. So pretty much photon is a big fancy word for energy. This photon comes in here, and it comes in and it gets into that electron. And what will happen, it gives that electron more energy. So what will take place is that electron can jump up an energy level. 
Now this is the key whenever it wants to jump to an energy level. These energy levels, they're like the salty spittoon. I'm telling you. You're trying to get into these things, they're hard to get into, okay? They're like the salty spittoon, you remember it, okay? We all know, Spongebob's trying to get in, you ain't getting into the salty spittoon unless you've got muscles on your muscles. You ain't getting into the salty spittoon unless you've got muscles on your eyeballs. You ain't getting into the salty spittoon unless you're willing to eat a bowl of nails without any milk. That's a real man or real woman. In this, this is what takes place. It has a fixed amount of energy. So let's say for this, for example, this first energy level, let's say that it has to have just seven joules of energy. That electron sitting in there at that normal, at that ground state, the normal level where it sits, it has an energy of seven joules. That's the only way it can be in that level of the softest platoon. Now, if you're going to get into the second level of the softest platoon here, let's say, for example, you got to have, I don't know, 16 joules of energy. That right there is where you're eating your bowl of nails and you ain't got no milk. All right, the first level we can have some milk in a bowl of nails. Second level, no milk. This is what will take place whenever it jumps up like that. We'll fly over here. And we'll get this electron into the second energy level. Now this is the key. It has to have that amount of energy. It can't have any less amount of energy. This photon has to add enough energy. We have to go for the example I drew up here. We have to go from 7 joules of energy to 16 joules of energy. If we have 15.9 joules of energy, we are not at 16 joules of energy. You're not getting into the second energy level. You have to have that exact level. Now, this whole process that's taking place has a very fancy name. This is what we like to call the quantum leap. Quantum leap, that's just when these electrons are going from one energy level to another. And this is the thing, it happens instantaneously. How can it happen instantaneously, Mr. Hall? It's got to have a certain amount of energy. Well, if it don't have 16 joules, it ain't getting in there. It's kind of like you come up to the door of the softest platoon and you try to open it and the bouncer just like opens the door and kicks your face in and says, Not today, Nancy boy. Get out of here. But when you get in here, you got to stay there in the first energy level. But now this is what happens if you come in there and you're chowing down on like some bowls of nails without any milk, they'll let you into the second energy level. And now you have went from what we call the ground state and you've jumped over here to what we call the excited state. This is the way I like to remember it. You're in this excited state. When you're at it, you're excited. There's more energy to it, okay? Think about it. It's like you at 1... 1 p.m. when you wake up and you're probably looking and saying, Mr. Hall ain't sitting nothing out on your mind. Then you go back to sleep and you wake up at 5 and you're like, oh, Mr. Hall did. i got to watch this video now. And you get up and you grab this Red Bull and you chug 24 ounces of Red Bull. And you play some games of Among Us and you drink a Monster and take a five-hour energy and you're drinking some coffee. You have finally made yourself into an excited state. Because not only you got wings, but those wings are flapping like a hummingbird. You are going to town. Okay, you have finally found yourself here in the excited state. Now, what will happen to you eventually after you drink all that and you've processed all that in your system? Anybody that's drank energy drinks, I went to college. I used to drink energy drinks in college, so I know the pain. You have that crush, that crash, okay? You're going to crash. And when you crash, you crash hard. And that's what will also take place. This electron is not normally in that excited state. It wants to go back. So what it'll do, 
it will go back to an excited state. So it comes down. Now hold on. Now let's, down, let's do the arrow this way. Hold on. Here's the thing. Can you just freely, can that electron that has 16 joules of energy just go down into the area where you're supposed to have seven, seven joules of energy? No. Remember, these energy levels, you have to have a fixed amount of energy to be in that level. So since we're going from what is now seven, uh, 16 joules of energy down into the 7 joules of energy, into that first energy level, let me get these on here. This is what happens. You can only have a certain amount of energy. Well, Mr. Hawk, well, what's going to happen? You've probably heard of this law. It's called the Law of Conservation of Energy. It's a pretty big, important thing, you know. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It can just be transferred into other things. So, what gave us the energy? That's right, the photon. The photon of electromagnetic radiation came in and gave us the energy. What do you think is going to come out? give us energy. Well, the energy has to come out in some way. We have to release. We have to transfer that energy. What's going to happen? Booyah. You got it. A photon will pop out. So now we have a photon that comes out. Now this is the really cool what happens here. This explains a lot of things that you look at and you see. When this photon comes out, when an electron goes to a lower energy level. Perfect example of this is the 4th of July. How does anybody in America, America, celebrate the 4th of July? Fireworks, baby. And this is all based off of this. These photons. Because this is what takes place. Remember what photons are. Photons are a certain quanta of energy. So, photon has energy. That amount of energy corresponds to a certain amount of, a certain frequency. That frequency corresponds to a certain wavelength of light. Or, sorry, not of light, but of electromagnetic radiation. If that wavelength that corresponds to that photon if it falls within the visible light spectrum, we see color. This is where color comes from. So what happens is whenever you're seeing that bright green, those bright, um, you see the bright reds and the blues, you're seeing all that blow up in the sky and all the firing off. What's taking place is these electrons had got to higher energy levels. How did it do that? Well, we lit it on fire and created an explosion, which, you know, adds a whole lot of energy. Thus, that electron came up. It did a quantum leap. It came up to the next energy level, and once it got to that energy level, then it crashed back down. So whenever it crashed back down, he had to release the energy off in some form, and it's going to release it off in a form of a photon, and that photon will correspond to a certain electromagnetic radiation. And in that case, what we'll see, if it falls within the visible light, we see the colors, which we look and we go, oh yeah, ooh, ah, ee, ah, yeah, go mark it. And we get so excited about it. This is what we're talking about these photons coming off. This photon corresponds to certain things. And this is where photons are really cool. Like I told you, this is where color comes from. Think about it right now. If you turn all light off in your room, in the room you're in, I'm talking every bit of the light, even the light coming from the sun, you turn everything off. Whenever you do that, it's pitch black in your room. So think about the color shirt you're wearing. Do you see the color? No, but as soon as you flip the light on, what takes place? What is light? 
Light is a wave, but it's also a particle. It's a particle called a photon. That photon comes in and is an exciting electrons in molecules inside your shirt. What happens is that electron performs a quantum leap and comes over into a, an excited state. So it's left the ground state and it's went to the excited state. Once it does that, it eventually says, hey, i got to go back. So what it will do is it will drop to the, first, to the energy level where it was. It doesn't have to be the first. It can be different energy levels. I'll just use first for example. But it will drop and what will take place is it can't hold all that energy and go to that uh, lower energy level. It has to release the energy off. As soon as it drops, it releases the energy off in the form of a photon. And what happens is that photon comes off and has a certain amount of energy, because all it is is a quantum energy, no mass. That corresponds to a certain frequency. That frequency corresponds to a certain wavelength of electromagnetic radiation. And within that, if it fits, if that wavelength of electromagnetic radi radiation, if it fits in the visible light spectrum, we see the color coming off. We'll see the red at 750. We'll see the purple at, oh, I want to say it's 450. I don't have electromagnetic spectrum up right now. Okay, we'll see the greens at 600. We'll, we'll see all of that. That's where we get color from. That's what's taking place. And what happens is those photons, they'll pop off is that those electrons, those photons will, will pop off and they'll come to our eye and inside our eye, this is how we process color is that photon has a certain amount of energy to it and it bonds within our photon receptors in our eyes. What happens is it comes in and it'll change the structure of the molecule and it'll send a signal to the brain that's, that's red, that's green, that's blue. And it tells us, it processes, and it gives us the image that we want. Whenever this is taking place, though, just like that was a quantum leap, which this is a quantum leap, this right here, the process of it coming back, remember, it happens subtly. This also is a quantum leap. This is how we see color. This is how we process color that we see in our daily lives. This is how we see images. We're processing so much, everything that's coming in, okay? Whenever you're looking at this, whenever you're seeing this, this is what's taking place. This is how we process so many things, and this is what's happening on that quantum level to give us the images and things that we process, okay? Now, we're, going, we're not leaving away from this. We're going to keep rolling with this quantum concept, okay? There's a quantum model of the atom, and that is the accepted model of the atom today that we get to talk about. That's why I get so excited about it. But here's the really cool thing, and this is where I'm going to leave off, okay? If you have questions on this, ask me. I know there's a lot of information here. There's a lot to take in, and whenever you guys see you in class in person, we'll, we'll get to answer some questions that you may have. Okay, but you need to come in with questions. Your class is a class that really never talks. And so, for whatever reason, please, love of all humanity, whenever you come into class, ask questions if you have them. Now, in this, have you ever wondered how, in uh, our universe, how is it that scientists can look and say that that planet has these elements on it and is made of this? I, I, for the longest time, was like, how can somebody that's never even set foot on Jupiter tell me what Jupiter is made of? There's no possible way. That makes no sense. It's impossible. And what you'll see is it actually is possible by doing and using the process of what we were just talking. So within this, you have something we call an electro, an electro, blah, 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 a line emission spectrum. There we go.
So slide emission spectrum, and this is what it is. Uh, I'm just going to talk to you about it. Whenever I see you in class, I'll show you more. Uh, right now, with everything going on with COVID, uh, typically what I would do is I would bring out some of these tubes and show you. I'll show you some of them in class unless you see them, but it's not going to be, you're not going to get to see it as well as normal. But what you'll see is in this line emission spectrum, what they actually do is they're taking light from a planet. And what they can do is they can bring that light in and they run it through a prism and what happens is it breaks apart and it breaks that light, that visible light apart and it gives certain bands at certain wavelengths of light. Now, whenever you look at it, every element off of the periodic table, they do this and their bands are at certain wavelengths. It's like a fingerprint for an element. This is how they can process and look and say that that, that that planet does not have oxygen on it. This planet has oxygen on it. This planet has water on it. They are literally, they're looking at light samples and just focusing it in and taking it away. I wanted to stress that to you uh, because it just links in with this and it's really cool stuff to talk about. But uh, pretty much, let you guys know, uh, I'm expecting to see you guys on Tuesday in class. Something happens and we can't, don't worry, we will either be Zooming or I'll be throwing a video out there. I think we're pretty much going to Zoom uh, if we're not in person on Tuesday because uh, we need to do the math part. Now I need to work you through some math problems there. Do not forget also, if we actually get to come back to school this week, I see you on Tuesday. I'm going on with new material but you will have your quiz on all that stuff that we covered with the mole. You will have it on Friday. Okay, so keep that in mind. If you have any questions, hit me up on your mind. If not, look forward to seeing you guys on Tuesday.